let's move on. Um, our next uh, speaker has approximately 16 years of uh, experience as human factors professional. Uh, he is currently a partner with Wargaming and acts as a senior UX scientist in the USA. Please welcome uh, Dr. Sean Stafford. Uh, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for attending the conference. And um, big thanks to the conference organizers if they're around for for putting everything together and dealing with crazy PhDs that have uh, no ability to keep track of their own lives, much less to attend conferences and keep everything scheduled. But uh, much, much appreciated. So today, first what I'd like to do is just talk about the high level of what I hope to do here today with, with the audience. And my goal is to come up with a common language for usability and playtesting and some tips, some, some tricks, some advice for both usability and playtesting, and talk about some of the methods that we use in usability and playtesting. Uh, this is one of the lectures that I often give. Uh, I teach at um, the university as well, and I teach classes in user research, research methods, personality theory. But this is one of my favorite lectures because it brings us back to the ground floor of why are we doing usability testing and play testing and what are they? How do we define these and what's their goal? So with that, I'm going to go a little bit high level at first and just talk about where these two tools, play testing and usability fit and what we do as user experience scientists for, for game companies, for Fortune 500 companies, and pretty, per, for pretty much anybody who wants to improve their products. When I look at these, and why I was asked to look at these two techniques is because they make up the core of what we do in user experience. Uh, probably around 80% of what we do is usability studies and playtesting studies with participants, people who are going to touch our products. And that means that we often have to come back and look at these and just keep in, in mind, like, what are these tests and w what's the core of these tests and what do they mean? So the first thing I'll start off with is playtesting. And even though I have a PhD and I you know, did a crazy dissertation and I've been a scientist for years, I, I don't make this a complicated thing for us to do in user experience. Playtesting is actually pretty simple. The main idea is to let people play a playable product and kind of leave them alone. Let them test the product. Try to remove myself, the game company, everybody else involved as much as possible. Let them have at the product. And often people will ask, well, how many how many times should you do something like that? How many times should you bring in people and just kind of leave them alone, let them play the product? And it can occur quite often. I have uh, students at every major game company now, and they come back and they tell me stories about how often they'll play test products. And then, of course, they'll come back with numbers as well. How many people play test these products per session? And they'll come back and tell me, yeah, we brought in 60 people today. And we're bringing in 60 people tomorrow. And then 60 people the next day. And I'm like, well, how, how many sessions are you going to do? Well, yes, it can occur 30, 40 times just for a single mode. This was an example of one of my students who worked on Battlefield 1. And you're talking thousands of participants touching that product. And, well, how often does it occur? We have to take into account some constraints, and really it's size of the team, how many people do we have in our user research team, how big is the company, how often can they get us stable builds, and, of course, executive buy-in, and that really comes down to budget because playtesting is costly because you're, you have large numbers of people playing a product, and you're bringing them into the room, mostly at the same time, and 
little dividers and separators to keep them from sort of looking over, over at each other's screens. Well, that's, that means you've got to have a pretty big room. You have to have lots of computers, and it, it will cost money, and you have to pay the participants, pay to recruit them. So once every several months to twice a week to three times a week, I've seen it work differently at different companies, and it's all the little components that come together that determine how often you're actually going to play test that product. Now, usability testing is the first type of test I ever learned about in user research. And I was working for the military, and I was, I was um, testing robotic vehicles. And uh, it was really cool. It was one person who can control three vehicles. And, and I show up, and I'm at the middle of this military installation, and I'm the young graduate student who is kind of getting into user research for the first time. It's around 1999. And I show up, and they say, OK, you're, you're going to run all of this today. And I'm like, OK, I'll figure it out. I'm going to do a usability study. And I just read a book on usability studies. And what the book said was, is that uh, you want to do this as often as possible, and you want to talk to the participant, and unlike play tests where you kind of let them be, and uh, you, you want to get inside their head and kind of understand why you're getting the results that you're getting. Like, for instance, people don't like the product. Yes, you've got some data from your play test that says, yeah, the metrics are going the wrong way, but now we need to get into their heads and understand why. So I'm sitting there with a bunch of soldiers, and I've got this billion dollar vehicle behind me and I'm a first year graduate student who has to figure out why nothing works and why the soldiers hate this particular product. So I was like, well, this is, this is going to be really difficult because I'm going to screw this up and I'm going to get fired. And I didn't get fired because I realized usability is actually pretty easy. Talk to them. You're going to be testing this product today. And uh, I just want to speak your thoughts out loud. And I'm going to ask you questions here and there. And uh, before you know it, we ran six or eight participants. And uh, I've got this executive behind me who's watching everything I do. And he's like, oh, this is magical. It's, a user, it's like I'm getting all this data from human beings. And I'm like, no, this isn't magical. This is a usability study. It's, it's simple. We can do this three or four times this week. I can come back tomorrow and do it again. He's like, well, how much do you charge? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I think I make like $8 an hour as a graduate student. And he's like, you know, dollar signs in his eyes. And that's when I realized, I was like, usability studies are, are pretty simple. It's not complex. It's not rocket science. You can do them often. You can get them done in one day. And so they can occur all the time. And several times a week, several times a day. It depends on what you're testing, how big your team is, etc. But it's much easier to get executive buy-in for a usability study because you usually need much fewer participants. And we'll talk about why you need fewer participants in a little bit. But some of my friends and me, of course, we've run these over 100 times on a single product. <clears throat> I've had a lot of good discussions with people in the game industry who are user experience scientists. And one of the things that we often agree at at our annual meetings is that playtesting is not a usability study, and a usability study is not playtesting. And when it comes to playtesting, where you bring in lots of people, it is usually going to be quantitative. And we'll, next slide, we'll say usability is qualitative. But you can observe people in a playtest. You can watch them touch the product. But the main goal is to kind of let them be. Let them play the product. Remove yourself from the product as a researcher. Try not to have logos up. Remove the game company as well. Remove, just have them be a gamer. Try to make it as if they're playing the game at home. And let them play the product. And therefore, you don't get a lot of discussions with them in a play test session because you don't want to become their friend. You don't want to get inside their head. You get a lot of data at the end of the play test session. You can observe them. You can watch them. And we have all these really great devices where we can have 60 people up on a TV screen at the same time and watch all 60 people playing the product, which having done that many times is actually pretty useless. 
It's like watching 60 different TV channels at the same time. It's impressive for executives. But what's really in of interest is what do all those people say that come into the play test? Do they tend to sort of trend towards a specific result? And you get some, you don't know why they're trending towards that result, and that's where usability is gonna come in. But you know, hey, we've got an issue here with this class or with this vehicle. So in that, in that sense, we often say, you know, play testing is, is, is uh, not a usability study, it's mostly quantitative. Another thing is, is just as I learned about usability studies, it's not rocket science. Yes, you can screw up a playtest study, but the idea is this is not a scientific study. I've done scientific studies where you spend weeks arguing about methodologies and sampling the right participants and making sure everything is perfect. In a playtest study, it's who are we interested in? Do they play this game? Yes, they do. Let's get them in and have them have hands on this product and play this product and, and see if they like it. Another thing is, is by keeping it sort of standardized, we can use the same methodology across many products and we can start to see how the metrics compare across the products. Once again, we may not know exactly why because we're not inside the participant's head. A lot of our data is going to come from surveys at the end of the play test but we can get inside the participants' heads later on with a usability study. And I don't want to spend too much time on it. I can have an entire lecture on what is qualitative versus quantitative. And this is more of a philosophical debate. But what I'd like to boil it down to here today and agree on is that when I say qualitative, I really mean talking to participants and having a dialogue, a discussion, and kind of keeping the Likert scales out of it. Instead of asking them on a scale of one to five, how, how much fun did you have, five being lots of fun and one being no fun at all, I'll just ask them, was the game fun or not fun? And I, I always ask questions that are not biasing, so I won't just ask, is it fun? I'll say, was it fun or not fun? Or just tell me about the game and we get into a discussion. Now, for the most part, participants will just flow right into it and you'll, you'll have this nice dialogue and then you can have one of your researchers typing down everything that is said, and you can get a lot of really good information from that. So that's what I mean by qualitative. Now, when I say quantitative, yes, it's still opinions, but it's usually captured in a Likert scale. Usually I use a survey tool for it. On a scale of one to five, then please explain your rating. And it's this massive amount of data, but it's, it's not a discussion. I don't do that in those in those play test sessions i can i can add a little bit to the end of a play test on the reverse side we just talked about play testing now we'll talk about usability testing and once again it's a you would not think we would have to say this in user research but we do and we always have to remind ourselves in the user research field that usability it's not a play test study and one of the things I see is when people try to turn usability into play tests and they say, we're going to come in, we're going to run 80 people in a row in a usability study, and we're going to talk to each one of them, 80 people. The first question I ask is, what researcher is going to do that? Like for us, who in here would like to talk to 80 people sequentially in a conversation and get information from them in a discussion? It's just not going to happen. And nor does it need to happen. And people will always ask, how many people do you need for this qualitative study? And my answer is, as all scientists would say, it depends. And then I'll get into a f another debate with my graduate students or people I'm working with, and I say it's all about effect size. People, number of people, is determined by what your expectations are for your findings. If you think the game's absolutely terrible, you probably need one person to come on in and tell you that. And then the second person to confirm the first person is not a complete fluke. You got those two people and we're like, this is the worst game in history. I have no idea why you're doing this. It's awful. Now that usually doesn't happen. Usually the game has some issues and you're like, okay, for a usability study to talk to these people, how many people do I need? It usually ends up being around six to eight people 
could be more or less. There's no magical number there. One of the things when you do these discussions with participants is you see patterns emerge right away. And you might have 12 people scheduled, but you'll cut it off at 10 because you're like, yeah, this is, we've got an idea of where this is going and what we're going to find. Usability testing is beautiful. Daily feedback to teams in a fast, iterative process. Uh, yeah, maybe, right? It depends on the builds. How often you're going to get a build and how many things of interest you actually want to study. But what we usually do is we'll you know, run three or four usability sessions on a single build and six to eight participants per session and we get just a gold mine of data. But it's not a play test. <clears throat> so let's go into usability. Why is a usability test mostly qualitative? Common mistakes in usability testing, analyzing data and usability testing. Why is it mostly qualitative? The biggest thing I get from game companies when they ask for a usability study is we've got our BI data, we know what's going on, but we, we don't know why it's going on. And what they're really saying is, is that we don't need a play test, we don't need you to sort of determine that something is going on. We know it's going on, but now we need you to talk to people. And so in talking to people, sometimes we can talk to them in the lab and get those details. Sometimes we have to call them on the phone because it's a play at home game and we can get those details, depending if the company allows that. But the details matter. And when I say details, I mean inside the person's head, having a conversation with the person. Cadence matters. You can do this all the time. You can do daily. And it's pretty cheap too. Four or five participants today, four or five tomorrow, depending on how many questions you have to answer and how quickly the team that you're working with can digest that information because someone still has to read these reports. It works really well with playtesting. One of my colleagues that I worked with several years ago often described playtesting as the canary in the coal mine for usability studies. Obviously, when the bird dies in the coal mine, everybody's got to evacuate. When you're starting to get data that says something is wrong in the playtest, you should probably follow it up with a usability study and talk to the participants to make sure that you understand why they're giving you those results. Yes, at the end of a play test, you can ask questions like, why did you give it that five point scale? And why this and why that? But you'll get so much more out of them if you get into a discussion and have that conversation with the participant, which is what you do in a usability study. <clears throat> Letting the players play is obviously extremely important. The researching, talking too much matters, and I, I have a whole separate lecture on all the different ways you can talk to a player during a usability study. It comes out of cognitive psychology. I'm gonna hint on that in a little bit here on the next slide. Um, and that's with the common mistakes in usability testing. You don't need to mix this with large numbers. That's where someone who comes to you and they don't understand usability testing versus play testing, and they say, I need a test of players. And they say, I, need, I want 100 people, and I want you to talk to all 100 people. Okay, you don't need to do that. That's a play test. You can do your play test, but a usability study, you don't need that. Six to eight people, maybe 10 people. Once again, it depends on what your anticipated effect is in that game. Mixed verbalization techniques. This is not something that you learn right away in psychology. And oftentimes, unless you're into clinical psychology, you don't understand that the way you talk to someone impacts the data that you're gonna get out of that participant. There are many, I'm just gonna bring up a few here, but the most common one that people talk about in usability research is think aloud. You got the participant sitting in front of you and you say, talk out loud while you're playing the game. It's called concurrent talking out loud, playing the game and talking out loud. It's like riding a bike and chewing gum, right? You should be able to do that. The next one is retrospective. Retrospective is when they play the game and then you stop them and you say, tell me about what you just did. Now, it can be 
interval retrospective or completely retrospective where they play the entire game and you start talking to them or you play for five minutes and then you start talking to them. And these are just a few. Task oriented, you give them some tasks and usability research and then you, see, you measure and have them talk about attaining those tasks, attaining that goal. And then of course, introspection. This is a really weird one and I've seen some researchers use it. You have to be very careful. There's a difference in saying, tell me everything you like and dislike about this game versus asking them to tell you how they feel. While you're playing the game, tell me how you feel. And it, especially with Americans, they're like, feelings? No one cares about my feelings, but let me, yeah, I feel weird playing this game. The worst thing you can do is switch techniques you have to remain consistent and you have to know that each of these is going to impact their working memory differently and you're going to get different information. If you switch every participant, you're going to have some issues. Analyzing data, it is extremely important that you have immediate analysis. This is not a scientific study. Best case scenario, you've analyzed the data that day or the next day. And we have this rule, it's like a 24-hour rule for usability studies. If you don't have that data written up and analyzed in 24 hours, you sh the emergency flag should go up and you're doing something wrong. Because the team needs that. They need to move on. They need that information. Real-time note-taking. Don't wait until after the usability study to, to, take, to write notes and go back and watch videos. Have someone take those notes immediately. It will help you in writing the report. The main findings. Major issues, trends, patterns, and everybody loves colors. And it works really well for people who have no time, which is pretty much everybody in the game industry. If you can color code it, red, really pay attention to this issue. Yellow, if you have time, pay attention to this issue. Green, I'm adding in some green stuff because I have to say something positive about your game, other than never ask me to do a usability study again. Don't even look at the green stuff. So. There's some tricks, and we can go into all types of different reports that we can put together in another lecture. Playtesting. Why is playtesting mostly qualitative, quantitative, common mistakes in playtesting, analyzing data in playtesting? Why is it mostly quantitative? Numbers matter. And I have a lot of colleagues who work at Microsoft, and one of the first questions we got into is, how much do numbers matter? And what's the correct numbers? And we had a debate, is it 60 people? Is it 100 people? And we settled on 64. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was just because we were tired of talking about it that we settled on 64, but it seemed like a good number. And you know, we took statistics and it's double that magical 30 number you learn in statistics about pulling chips out of a bag. And so the numbers matter and they still matter in playtesting. Letting the players play matters. Key, just let them play. Don't talk to them. Let them do their thing. Let them play the product. Don't have any brands up. No nothing. Don't even let them know you work for the gaming company. You play games? Yeah, come on in. Sit down. Play this product. I'll give you a gift card at the end, of course. And you can leave at any time, but play the product. <sighs> Removal of research bias and subjectivity. Save that for usability. Don't introduce yourself. Don't become their friend. Let them play the product. Let the product stand on its own. Common mistakes. I always see hybrid models, mixed method designs, taking your playtest study and making it a scientific one-off. That's where the methodology you chose will only work for that game at that moment in time. Maybe because the, the build you're working with is special. Researcher driven, having complex instruction sets coming from the researcher that you can't possibly remember what you did and replicate for other builds you're going to get for that game or your competition's builds. Not repeatable, that's the big thing. Are your questions one-offs? They better not be because you'll be asked to compare the data you're getting in this playtest to another playtest in the future. Not usable for comparison with competitors. You gotta make sure your questions are sort of open so they can be compared across games. Yes, you can have some specific questions. Save those for the end of the playtest survey. No ability to track a project as it changes. Demographics can't be compared. 
and then researcher changes. If the researcher is a big part of the play test and you lose the researcher, then all of a sudden you've lost that data because the researcher was part of it. Now that is an issue in usability studies because you are having a conversation and different people have different conversational abilities. Some people are terrible at talking to participants as they are terrible at talking to everybody in the world. So you have to be, you have to know what you're getting into when you introduce a human into the loop and that's why in playtesting we want to remove people from the loop and we want them to play the product. Analyzing data, high level, it's quantitative, lots of numbers, some qualitative analysis, maybe some exit interviews, some brief stops, maybe some minor dialogue, but not a lot. And then some behavioral observation. If you let people quit at any time and 30% of your audience got up and left after two minutes, that's a problem. But that's behaviors, and it's like, well, you know, it's, it's also called selection bias as well, or it's, it's an issue because the only people left playing your product are the ones who actually like your product. So you do have to include that in the report. Verbatim, multiple questions, every question is analyzed. Making it happen, and I only have five minutes left, but all of these components here are they're, they're entire lectures to themselves, but the key here today is that you and I can agree that usability research, usability studies, and playtest studies, they're different. They work together. And this is not something I've made up. This is conversations and agreements across many organizations and many years of experience in the industry. We got that, but yeah, everything's got to come together, making it happen. A good room. What size room do you need for usability studies? A room maybe to fit two people into. You know, depends culturally. Like Americans really don't want you sitting next next to them. They want space. So you gotta have like that obligatory chair between two people. Whereas in other cultures you can sit right next to them. So, you know, the room doesn't really matter too much. When I started this, when I started doing usability studies, I could use any room. Once I got a research lab, all of a sudden I was like, oh, you got to have a research lab. You don't, need a, you don't need a perfect research lab. You just need a room to have a discussion. For a play test, that's different. Not only do you need a large room, you need lots of computers in a, in a great facility to run those, those studies. Good moderators. Obviously, for a usability study, you need someone who can have a conversation and, and keep in mind how they're impacting the other person's working memory. And that requires a little bit of training. When I first get someone into usability research, I have them run the study by themselves and then I'll come back and watch the video. I don't wanna hover over them because then they'll freak out and get paranoid about maybe they're doing something wrong. But when it comes to these studies, the moderator, they matter in both playtesting and usability, but it really matters in usability because you're having that conversation. When it comes to playtesting, it's really about can you point them to the right chair? Can you make sure they're taking the right survey? And can you make sure they don't take out cameras and take any pictures or take out a thumb drive and, and access the computer? Good tools, streaming tools, survey tools. Well, I use Qualtrics. Good computers and of course, good participants. And this is the tricky one. We, you know, game centers, Facebook, universities, marketing companies, each of them has their own pros and cons. But we look at that and we, we say, well, how does this impact the usability study or playtest study? My final slide, and this is key, and I see people get paralyzed all the time in user experience. They're looking for the perfect solution. There is no perfect solution. When you get into research methods and you start to memorize all the different, they call these threats to validity that occur in any study, you'll realize that you always fail at something. I had to memorize these in grad school for what we call comprehensive finals. And if you failed the test, they kicked you out of grad school and they locked you in this room and you had to regurgitate every single threat. I was like, this is horrible. But now I realize by having that knowledge, I realize no solution is perfect. 
And one person can argue it one way. We have to do the study way, this study this way because of X. And I'll say, yeah, but if you, if you control for X, then Y and Z are an issue. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know Y and Z existed. The key here is you just want to make the study as best as possible. You want to know about external, internal constructs, statistical validity, and just make sure that you're aware of there's many things that can impact the study and cause it to go the wrong way. And the knowledge is key. That way, when someone does come back and criticize you for the way you've run your study, you can say, yeah, I know, but the reason that I chose to do the study this way is because I thought this threat was a larger threat and would contribute more to error. Know when to run between and within designs. And this is pretty simple. This, this language I've always hated in psychology. I always th thought it was just language that was meant to keep people out of getting, becoming researchers. All that means is, you know, within designs is if you have two games, A and B, the person plays both games. And if it's between one person plays A and one person plays B and you sort of compare. Obviously, if the person plays both games, you know they like one better than the other. If two different people play two games, you're like, well, if one likes this game more than this one, why? Is it, is it something inside that person? Just know that there's a lot of things that can impact that. And from my perspective, the reason you wouldn't do a lot of these between or within subjects designs where the person plays the same game, there's just a lot of learning that takes place. And once they learn one game, it's with them forever. And that learning is going to go to the next game no matter what. And the next game is usually easier for them. But each scenario is different. No one to run single day testing versus multi day testing, especially in play test studies. People are quitting our game. What do they quit on the first day? No, they quit on the third day. So if you were asking me to bring people in and measure them, I should probably run them for a minimum of three days. So yeah, I can gauge them correctly. Always focus on the day to day details while keeping in mind the data will need to live on. And that's you know meeting your customers' needs for usability studies and playtesting, but recognizing you might not remember what you did for that study a year from now. And someone may ask you questions. So make sure you document everything, your methodology you chose for usability, the questionnaire you used for your playtest, and then if you can pull that data up later on and have it live again for another comparison, then you're doing your job. So at this point, I will open up for questions. Thank you. Hi, Sean. <laughs> Um, my question is next. You have uh, mentioned uh, some psychological uh, study, psychological phenomena. Uh, you use uh, probably some th uh, theories uh, preparing you surveys or scenarios. Could you please uh, just name or stress a little bit uh, regarding those phenomena if uh, they have uh, dedicated names in psychology? Yes. Uh, what can be read to, uh, at the theory? Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, for, for threats to validity, if you want to be a, a researcher and you want to understand what you can do wrong in research studies, there's a classic book by three authors. It's always, it's never one author in psychology. Shaddish, Cook, and Campbell. Shaddish, Cook, and Campbell wrote a book on threats to validity. I believe it's called Quantitative Analysis and Research Design. But if you go on Amazon and you Shaddish, Cook, and Campbell, you will get a comprehensive lesson on the threats to validity. And what that does is going to make you paranoid at first. Like, I should never run a research study because I can't do it right. But then you'll read the next chapter after he introduces all the threats to validity and you realize it's just knowledge. It's just knowledge of constructs. Are, you, are, you, are the words you're using the correct words? Are you asking the words in the wrong way? And you and I, we're 
we have discussions about that all the time. And when you stop asking about construct validity and you think you've got it right, that's when you've got it wrong. You're like, ah, oh, if we use the term fun, what does that really mean? That's construct validity. Statistical validity. How many participants do you need in a test? Comprehensive discussion on that. It depends. The difference between sort of new Coke and old Coke when they did the taste testing, they were identical. So you need like thousands of people. And the implication for that company was billions of dollars. So they got thousands of people. Because there is no difference and that was the whole goal. There's no difference, so you need a lot of people. But if you, you expect differences and you think there's gonna be differences, you, you can lower the number of participants. External validity. You know, how is this how is this data going to translate to the real world? What are you doing differently in your research study that's going to impact its ability to go to the real world? And then internal validity. What are your measurements? So what I would suggest is pick up that book and that's your starting point, and that's research methods one. And then after that, for usability testing, they can visit his website. He's got a lot of good stuff on there. So. But there's a, there's a lot of other books I would recommend as well. But I would say start with Shaddish, Cook, and Campbell for, for validity. Any other questions? Does it just work? Okay. Uh, so as game developers, we often target very specific um, consumer groups, um, you know, which, which helps us narrow the focus of our games, etc. Uh, in your usability testing, and, and particularly also in play testing, how do you make sure that you have participants that actually match our consumer groups? Um, because obviously, if, if you get players to play our games that aren't actually our target audience, then we would get results that we know are false, essentially. Yeah, um, the, it, it's, this is a debate, right, in the, in the gaming industry to this day about what's the perfect participant. And I would say that it's dangerous. If someone comes to you and says, this is the perfect participant for our game, we need to recruit this perfect participant, I will say, that means you're gonna get perfect data. It means you're gonna get what you're looking for. Oftentimes, what they really mean is, we prefer people who play these types of products. You know, we're looking for gamers that play Overwatch, for example, or, or play certain types of MMOs. So usually, as a user researcher, you have to say, what do you want to find? Like, what's your goal? Well, I want to see if people who play these types of games like this product. But not that, you know, people who like the Dallas Cowboys and play on only an iPhone will like this particular product. And just as we get lost in the weeds, getting paralyzed, designing research studies, you have to understand that sometimes BI gets lost in the weeds too. And they've got such boiled down homework that they end up giving you this say, oh, it's gotta be this person who's this age that plays this game that does, that canoes. And you're like, why would anybody who's canoe, where's the predictive value in that? And you gotta step back and say, can we leave out canoeing and just go for people who are in this little bit wider age group that play these types of games? And then you end up with the right you know, participants, but it's always a discussion. And then recruiting it, whole different story on recruiting. I'll just want to say one thing, just because someone's a marketing company doesn't mean they're giving you who they say they're giving you. Oftentimes, marketing companies come with stipulations that you can't take any of the data from that participant because they don't want you cutting them out of the loop and getting them money. But I've had some interesting conversations with participants from marketing company where I'm like, yeah, you're the right participant, but how many studies did you do this year? 60? and you made $150 per study, you're like, that's $10,000. You're like an employee. So yeah, you gotta be careful of where you get those perfect participants from. But it, for the most part, a marketing company will give you what you're looking for. It's just a matter of what else are they giving you with that. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, uh, thanks, very interesting topic. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I missed the beginning, so I'm not sure if you if you answered my question already. Uh, but 
nowadays when when you have these Spotify's and and things that recommend you that okay you listen this music so then you would perhaps like this music. Uh, I don't know how this algorithm is actually done. I myself back in the day studied a bit neural networks uh, and, and 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 those. Uh, so my question is actually would neural networks suit to analyze? Um, uh, the, the 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 data of usability testing. If if we if we if we really measure everything, that that you, that you may make, we we make it so complex the data that 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 then the neural network could make very interesting fo groups focus groups uh, group, no, audience audience groups I would say with different tastes. That you like this they, they like this type of game, this kind of type of game. A bit like the result would be a bit like that sure. Spotify thinks that you like this music because of that you are in a group in, in some <coughs> based on yeah. some algorithm. I, I don't know. It's difficult to formulate this question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, let me summarize. So I think the question is, is would neural networks help with analysis of research studies and g maybe give us some insight that we might not find with our human analysis, looking at the data. And I, I mean, I think it's, I'm gonna probably take it the easy way out of this, is yes and no, probably no right now, but yes in the future, as our neural networks get better. As a human factors person, my entire career was based on human machine interaction and making machines like really help humans and eventually replace us. And we're seeing that now. But when it comes to the analysis part, especially with really complex data sets, it's gonna take some more time. Because the more complex, the more variables you have, the more the tools sort of just, you know, you might not get what you were looking for, but probably eventually, yes. Hopefully after I'm gone. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yes. In the beginning of your speech, uh, you uh, mentioned about your lectures in uh, personality. Uh, yes. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, your psychological background in usability uh, tests. Yes. Um, does your knowledge about personality uh, help or interfere uh, in these uh, researches? Well, I, uh, so the question is, is what about personality? And I love personality. It's one of the favorite, my favorite classes. The unfortunate part is the measurement of personality. I call it death by survey. And especially for if you want to do big five factor or, or anything else, it's just more questions added to the test. So I do have some of my research team that are always like, can we do something more scientific? And maybe some predictive stuff with personality. And I'm like, I love to do it. And, you know, then we get into talking about what are our predictions about personality. And one of the questions is, is what type of people, and in my lab, is why do people play MOBAs? It's a terrible game genre full of really nasty people, right? And every night you play, you want to quit, but yet you come back. So what's that say about the person? And so we're like, well, we need to measure this. Well, how do we measure it? Personality theory. Okay, so we go get all the surveys and we talk about what we're doing there. We're like, well, how do we fit these in? Because the development studio really doesn't care about personality, although they should, and they probably do, especially if you found something. But we gotta make sure we don't kill our participants with massive numbers of questions. So right now we are trying this and we are measuring personality, but only in tests where we think we can get away with it where maybe we don't have a lot of research questions that need to be answered so we can afford to measure their personality. Or maybe we can measure their personality before they come into the lab with a pre-survey that they take at home, and then we can make some predictions. But I have a standing rule in my research lab. If we're gonna measure personality, you have to have a hypothesis and a complex hypothesis. You have to say that I think people who are neurotic and uh, extroverted, overly extroverted, highly neurotic, are the people who are driving the negative component of this game. And then I have to, I go a step further with them. So what does that mean? 
It's like, should we screen people before they play these games? And it's like getting rejected from the military. It's like, you can't play our game because you're going to make it terrible. So we go a step further there as well. But one thing we can't, that I don't allow them to do is just ask, ask the entire personality inventory and then go fishing. It's like, because I found weird stuff, stuff in personality research. One of my first studies was how many shades of yellow can a person see? I'm like, because I worked for a psychologist from the University of Cincinnati and they were considered individual differences psychologists. And they were like, measure everything about personality that you possibly can. I'm like, why? And they go, because this is such a boring study that we're more interested in the people who will try to determine the shades of color than how many shades of color they can actually research. And I was like, that's a really weird personality yeah. question. I hope that answers your, your question is I love it. I think everybody's going that way. I think Bartle's player types are a great first step at this. But I think it's, we, right now we have a problem with just the sheer number of questions we ask in these uh, playtest studies and usability studies. It, and it does come back to money. Some of these inventories can take an hour and that's like, you have to you know, compensate them for an additional hour. But I love it and I think it should be done. Yeah, Does that answer yeah. your question? Kind of, yeah. I, I, I got inspired from great, great question and, and, and then I, I, I thought that if if now those, all those SOMES, they collect all the information from us, so they know our personalities basically, <laughs> or should know. So, so w would you, for example, see uh, this as a possible path that, 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 that playtesting, for, for playtesting uh, purposes, you could buy per this personal data from Google, Google or, or, or Facebook or, or somewhere, and, and then you would know, know, of course, a lot of, yeah. of, of the people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, and, and that's one of the things that does come up, and we just, we as researchers have to be very careful for asking for Facebook profiles, because it could violate um, some type of confidentiality, depending on what region you're in. We don't do it, but in personality research, I love the predictive measures based on your Facebook profile. It can be misleading for some people who now just don't post anything because they don't trust social media. But uh, yeah, I show my, my team all the time word blooms from Facebook that correlate with the big five factor, and it's very enlightening. You know, the people who whine and complain and everything else, they pretty much fit a certain personality profile, and it can be predictive. And they, but you know, there's always the legal department, which is asking how invasive, how much data are we collecting on these people? and how invasive do we want to be? And I, I will say as well that like, especially in America, we, there's gender differences between who would share their Facebook profile and who would not. And there's personality differences in that as well. It's like, you want my Facebook? Sure, you can have my Facebook profile. Just the, the fact that they were that free giving tells me, yeah, I can pretty much tell what type of personality you are. <laughs> Whereas the other person's like, I'm not so sure about that. I don't share my Facebook profile with anybody. That being said, it's a wonderful idea. And yes, it is somewhat predictive. And I've seen some good algorithms run on people's Facebook profiles that show personality types. Are we out of time? We have, we're out of time. We have time for one more question. One more question. Hi, Sean. Thanks for the presentation. My name is Yuri, Wargaming St. Petersburg. I want to ask you about playtest versus usability test goals. I think that from your presentation it follows that they have slightly different goals and they, you, they should apply at different stages of product lifetime. Is that true? Yeah, that is correct. And it's, it, it's a, even a little bit, you know, I see it might even be a little bit simpler than that. The, the goals of, for a usability study is just simply, we see what's happening, why is it happening? What's going on inside their life, inside their head that is making them, for the most part, not want to play this product? Why did they enjoy it and now they don't? And that data came from some type of quantitative data. 
Now, oftentimes, the playtest is very useful because you don't want to release that product into the public, and you don't want to get that wonderful BI data, by the way. But off, that's too late. It's like, yeah, you've got the BI data, but you're live. And people are already making judgments of your product. If you've got your Metacritic rating, it is what it is. They won't change it. So that playtest will work early on for you to sort of imitate what you're going to get when you're when you go live, depending on the number of participants you have and if you just let the players play the product as they normally would at home. But it always happens, and I love it when someone calls me and says, we know why, but we don't know why. And I'm like, what do you mean? This doesn't make any sense. And they're like, we, we need to ask them and talk to them. And for instance, we have a wonderful test going on right now where we're, we know where people are quitting and that doesn't, it's not helpful because we don't know why people are quitting. We just know they're dropping out. You know, so we got to fix something here, but what do we fix? Everything? And we're talking to the participants in a usability study, having a conversation, and they're telling us why. They say, yeah, it's just, this is why. I'm like, well, that's great information. Thank you. Where does it occur? It occurs when you first get a playable product. Are there different types of play tests you can run? Yes, of course. If it doesn't have a tutorial, you can have a sort of a human tutorial, but you got to make sure you check a box on that playtest that says this playtest is a little bit different from a standard playtest where they're going to play the tutorial and play the product because you've inserted a human in the loop. And now it's a little bit it's like a modified playtest because it's not truly what they would do at home because the game company hasn't built the tutorial yet. So is that data different? Yes, it's slightly different. Just document it, archive it, and that's a playtest that would occur early on. Whereas a playtest that would occur later would have the tutorial in it. And one of the things you have to know as a game company is you can have the best game in the world early on. Once you throw that tutorial in there, it tanks the entire game. So if you haven't done a tutorial playtest and a non-tutorial playtest, and you haven't really thought about the differences, you haven't done your homework. And we've seen that happen where the core gameplay is wonderful, but no one will ever get there because no one will ever figure out how to play the product. And the reason it did well in playtesting was we gave them a PowerPoint presentation. It's like learning to play an MMO for the first time. I can remember playing Star Wars Galaxies for the first time. I was not, not going to happen. So I called up my friend for 30 minutes. We talked, and he's like, this is what you need to do. We do that in playtesting. But if you don't document it correctly, where it's at in the product life cycle, you'll end up with some pretty bad data at the end. And then usability studies can be done pretty much all the time. And so thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Stafford. Thank you.